Welcome to this video lecture about psychological methods and data analysis. Uh, my name is Michelle Nuyten and I'm a PhD student and lecturer at the Department of Methodology and Statistics. If you're watching this video, you're probably interested in psychology. So you might wonder, what does methods and statistics have to do with psychology? Why is this interesting for me? Well, what I hope to achieve in this video lecture is to give you an idea why it is important to look at methods and statistics when you want to research psychology, but also how methods and statistics can be an interesting field on its own. And to do that, I would like to use the example of operationalizing. And operationalizing has to do with the question, how do you measure invisible things? And if you look at measurement, if you want an example of something that is measured, all you need to do is open a paper. So look at the next couple of headlines. The first headline, drinking beer makes you better at sex, an awesome study says. Or another one, uh, brain science, does being left-handed make you angry? Or children who sit in the middle are more successful later in life? Feeling lonely, take a warm bath? Or finally, does high IQ increase the risk of depression and mental disorders? In all of these headlines, they're talking about research, and in all this research, something was measured. So somehow they measured how much beer people were drinking. And somehow they measured how good at sex they were. They measured how successful they were. And they measured uh, how often children sat in the middle seat. And if you talk about measurement, it's important to think about what you're doing. In measurement, you try to assign people a value on something. And things that we often measure are, for instance, uh, length and weight. And those are relatively straightforward variables. And when I say a variable, I simply mean something that varies. That means that we can have different values on the variable length. I am maybe shorter than you or taller than you, so we have different values. And these variables are relatively easy to measure because we can observe them, we can see them. Whereas that is not always the case. If you think about psychology, how am I going to measure an invisible psychological construct such as intelligence or depression? I can't simply sort of put a ruler next to your head and say how depressed you are. So we need to come up with something else. In psychology, we therefore need to make variables. We need to sort of create them. We have this theoretical construct so, such as intelligence or extroversion or depression, something invisible, and we need to make it measurable. We need to make it concrete. And this process of making an invisible variable concrete is called operationalizing. Let's look at an example. This is a schematic way of representing operationalizing. I have this theoretical invisible construct at the top, and what I want to do is I want to make a visible operationalization of that. So for example, if I want to measure faith, faith is not something I can directly see. So what I could do, what I could try to do to make it visible, to make it concrete, is simply say, well, I'm going to measure faith by looking at the answer to the question, I believe in God, yes or no. Or another example, if I want to measure intelligence, I cannot directly see your intelligence. So I need to come up with a way to make it concrete. And how that's often done is with an IQ test. An IQ test is a series of a different type of tests and a score rolls out and this score represents your value on intelligence. If we look at another example, uh, we can for instance ask how we measure depression. Depression is a very commonly uh, researched topic in psychology. So it's important that we think about how we can measure this. So let's think about it. Um, a first way we could measure depression is just ask. Maybe we should just ask everyone, are you depressed? Do you see a problem with this approach? Maybe if you look at this cartoon, you immediately see one of the problems here. I mean, this, this uh, question, um, how does your crippling depression make you feel, is highly suggestive um, and therefore probably not a very good question. But even if you ask, are you depressed in a sort of a neutral way, um, there might be problems with this. And the main problem is the difference between people and how they feel. Like some people will probably only need sort of minimal gloominess to say that they're depressed, whereas others might have a severe depression and just say that they're fine. So there's 
variance in how people answer this question and that makes it very different, difficult to compare people just based on their answers. So this is probably not a very good way to measure depression. So let's look at another way of doing this. Um, maybe a good idea is um, to look at a Rorschach test. A Rorschach test is a pro so-called projective test and in a Rorschach test I will give you a series of ink blots and you will have to tell me what you see in them. So it's a relatively simple procedure. Um, the difficulty is that now as an experimenter I have to interpret your answers and sort of determine something about your unconscious thinking processes. So for instance, if, we need, if we're going to use this for depression, what I might say is, well, maybe if you interpret this inkblot in a negative way, then you're depressed. So if you see a bat or a monster or something scary, then I'm going to say you're depressed. Whereas if you interpret it in a positive way, maybe you see a butterfly, then I'm going to say you're not depressed. Here we have a problem again. The interpretation of these answers is subjective. So how I interpret the way you uh, interpreted this inkblot is subjective. If you saw a, a bat, is it necessarily that negative that I will classify you as depressed? Or do you need to see a very scary monster in order to get this label depressed? And for instance, I, I keep seeing these weird chihuahua dogs in this inkblot. Does that mean I'm depressed or not, or just crazy? I don't know. So this is a very difficult way to establish depression as well. So this, let's also not use this method to measure depression. Um, let's look at another way. Maybe we should just count the number of symptoms. Depression has a couple of symptoms. Maybe we should just count them and see how depressed you are. And this might sound very logical and it's actually also the way things are done now, roughly. Right now, if we need to diagnose someone with a mental disorder, we use the DSM-5, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual for Mental Disorders. And in this manual for each disorder, there are standard categories of symptoms, and these are determined by experts. So for instance, for depression, we have nine different symptoms. And you don't need to read them all, but if you just focus on the, the words uh, printed in bold. For instance, you have a uh, depressed mood as a symptom of depression, you have decreased interest, um, weight change, uh, problems with your sleep, problems with activity levels, maybe fatigue or feelings of guilt and worthlessness, uh, problems with concentration, and as a final uh, symptom, the most severe one, I would say, uh, suicidality. These are the nine symptoms, and for uh, in order to get the classification depressed, you would need five out of nine symptoms. And it's slightly more complicated than that, but roughly they say if you have five out of these nine symptoms, you are depressed. If you think about that and the way that they are looking at depression and these symptoms, uh, there's sort of a theoretical assumption underlying this. Namely, the idea is that you have a depression and this depression is causing these symptoms. So depression is sort of an invisible entity in your head and because you're depressed, you have insomnia. And because you're depressed, you have a diminished concentration. And this holds for every other symptom in this list. They're all caused by something underlying, namely the invisible entity depression. This is an idea that is very similar to medicine. And if you take a look at this example, for instance, you have a brain tumor and this brain tumor uh, gives you symptoms such as headaches and drowsiness. This is yeah, very annoying, of course. I mean, above the fact that you have a brain tumor, these headaches and the drowsiness are, something, are things that you don't want. So what I could do is I could give you pills to cure both these symptoms. I can give you, I don't know, par a strong paracetamol against your headache and some other medicine pill um, against your drowsiness. And because of that, these symptoms disappear. However, your brain tumor is still there. And that is a very important difference with the way that we are looking at psychology and mental disorders. Uh, take a look at the next example. You see that the beginning structure is sort of the same. You have this, this underlying uh, problem which is causing these symptoms. And I could also now give you pills to cure these symptoms. 
For instance, I can give you sleeping pills to cure your insomnia. And there are medicine that can help you with concentration problems. And I could even give you pills to help you against a depressed mood. So say that I can find some sort of drug, some kind of pill to cure every single symptom of depression. Then you need to stop and think about something. If you successfully fight the symptoms of a depression, do you still have a depression? So what if all these symptoms disappear? Which probably means that you just feel fine because all your symptoms are gone. Can you still hold on to the idea that you still have a depression? The same as we were looking at this brain tumor that was still there even though we cured the symptoms. Probably not. If you cure the symptoms of a depression, your depression is gone. So maybe the way that we are looking at depression right now is not the correct way. And as an alternative, there is the network perspective. And the network perspective states that there is no underlying variable called depression that causes these symptoms, but these symptoms cause and reinforce each other. So take an example. Say that you have chronic pain, and because of this chronic pain you can't sleep, which means that you have insomnia. This insomnia leads to fatigue. You're tired because you don't sleep. That makes a lot of sense. This fatigue leads to diminished concentration. And because of your diminished concentration, you're doing bad at work and you start to develop feelings of worthlessness because you don't do well at work. These feelings develop into a depressed mood, which can maybe uh, result in the loss of interest in things that you were originally interested in, which maybe might lead back to a diminished concentration. And maybe this depressed mood can also lead to a lack of appetite, which then leads to fatigue again. And maybe the feelings of worthlessness then also affect insomnia because you start ruminating about your worries and you don't sleep anymore, even, even worse. You can see sort of a network arising of symptoms that all affect each other. And what you see here is that I don't need an underlying entity depression to explain how these symptoms can develop. This is just an example uh, to show the following. If you want to operationalize a variable, it is very difficult in psychology. Even if we're talking about things that occur very often in psychological research, such as intelligence and also depression, as we just saw, it is very complicated to make a good decision of how you're going to measure something. And it's actually still subject of discussion in the scientific literature. So this is something you really need to keep in mind, that operationalizing or making a variable concrete is not just writing down a couple of questions and it is a choice and there might be many options possible and this can lead to different things. For instance, if we take a look at one of these headlines that we saw in the first one of the first slides, does IQ increase the risk of depression and mental disorders? This sort of basically wants to test the theory ignorance is bliss. So more specifically, people who are more intelligent will also be depressed more often. If I want to research this, I need a way to operationalize my construct, my psychological construct. And here I need two operationalizations. I need an oper operationalization for intelligence and one for depression. So this might look as follows. I want to know about a theoretical relation between intelligence and depression, but I cannot observe it, so I will operationalize it. And the first choice I could make is the following. Maybe I will measure your intelligence with an IQ test and I will measure your depression with the number of symptoms you have that are listed in the DSM-5. Then I take a look at what the relation is between your IQ and the number of symptoms. If you have higher IQ, does it mean you have more symptoms or is there something else going on? And based on what I find there, I draw a conclusion about the theoretical relation that is underlying it. However, I could have chosen something else as well. Instead of IQ, maybe my choice was to make intelligence concrete by asking you the question, are you intelligent, yes or no? It might not be a good operationalization, but it is an operationalization, it is a choice, it is a way to make or to try to make intelligence observable. And the same holds for depression. Maybe I, sh I shouldn't have counted the number of symptoms, maybe I decided to give you a Rorschach test and count the number of demons you saw. And then I look for a relation between these two operationalized variables and then draw a conclusion about the underlying entities that I think are underlying it. And this type of flexibility can lead to several kinds of problems. 
if you take a look at this, this is sort of the, the, the way a research process can go. Maybe my first choice was IQ and a number of symptoms. And I'm pretty convinced that there is a relationship between intelligence and depression, and I measure IQ and number of symptoms, and I don't find anything. My conclusion can then be, well, maybe there is no relationship between these two things, or maybe I think, well, I, maybe I've taken the wrong operationalizations. I should try another set of operationalizations. Maybe answer to the question, are you intelligent? And the number of demons in the Rorschach test. Say if I chose these and I still didn't find it. Now I can still continue with different operationalizations. For instance, um, I'm going to measure intelligence with the question, do you, ever, do you ever read Tolstoy? And I'm going to measure depression with the question, do you ever feel gloomy when you read a book? And look and behold, here I find a relationship. And now the next morning you uh, come downstairs, you look at the doormat, and this is what you see. The headlines. Scientific research shows that high intelligence leads to crippling depression. Consequence, take your children out of school while you still can. This is, of course, a very exaggerated example, but this is the kind of things the kind of thing that can happen. So if you see a news message, a newspaper article that boldly states scientific research shows, your first instinct must be, all right, but how did they measure this? How did they establish this relationship between intelligence and depression? What kind of variables did they choose? How did they measure it? How did they analyze their data? What choices are underlying this research and do they justify this conclusion? And these kind of questions are the type of questions you think about if you're working on psychological methods and data analysis. So to sum up this presentation, this video lecture, the first thing you need to realize is that in psychology we need to measure invisible things. And this is difficult, so we need to make them concrete, and we call this operationalizing. And in operationalizing there are many choices you can make, and these can affect your conclusions. And that means that when you're reading scientific research, you need to be critical. Be critical when you read about science. And with that, I would very much like to thank you for your attention, and I hope to see you in one of my lectures in the future.